p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3. Now a House hearing on efforts to reduce greenhouse gases in the U.S. The Obama administration favors a cap-and-trade system, which sets limits on greenhouse gases through a permit process. The permits can be traded by the companies that buy them. Henry Waxman of California chairs the Energy and Commerce Committee, and Ed Markey of Massachusetts chairs the Subcommittee on Energy and the Environment. Here's a two-hour portion of that hearing. this uh, historic hearing and uh, we apologize once again for the delay. Um, we have no control over the length of the roll calls as they are conducted on the floor of the House, but uh, we now are in a situation since those were the last roll calls um, on the House floor that we can now have an uninterrupted uh, hearing with our brilliant uh, witnesses and uh, and uh, continue to build out this record on uh, how to handle uh, these very important uh, issues that are facing our country. Uh, let me begin by yielding for our first witness to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, and it is uh, my pleasure to introduce one of the witnesses we have on our panel this afternoon, Mayor John Fetterman from Braddock, Pennsylvania. Uh, Braddock is a, a community in Allegheny County, and, and uh, it is Allegheny County's poorest community. Uh, this was once a thriving blue-collar town of 20,000 people uh, and a place where my father spent 30 years of his life working at uh, U.S. Steel. Today, uh, Braddock has a population of 2,800 people. Uh, John Fetterman has uh, been someone who has been working tirelessly in his first term as mayor of Braddock uh, and, and playing a critical role with, with youth employment in Braddock through green jobs. Uh, he is, uh, with the assistance of some foundations, uh, put together urban farming, community gardens. He has been assisting residents in Braddock to cre create vegetable gardens. And uh, he has currently is working on a program where youth will be assisting in the installation of the first green roof in the Mon Valley. Uh, he is someone who thinks outside the box and, and is, is trying to revitalize a, uh, a community that is struggling and, and uh, is, is hopeful that what we do today with this legislation uh, will start a, a revolution in towns like Braddock and, and get people building things again. So uh, it is my pleasure to have him here today and my pleasure to introduce him to the committee. Great. And whenever you are ready, Mr. Fetterman, please begin. If you could turn on the microphone, please. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Burton, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I am John Fetterman, and I am proud to be the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. My testimony this afternoon will be short and straight to the point. I don't pretend to be an expert in economics or energy policy, but I do know what I have seen with my own eyes. The path we are on has failed. In my part of Pennsylvania, we have lost a quarter of a million jobs in the steel industry in the past decades. Once thriving towns like Braddock are facing economic devastation. Communities and families face desperate times. We need change, and we need it now. For decades, we have watched jobs leave America. For decades, we have heard about the dangers of America's addiction to foreign oil. For decades, we have seen real change blocked by those who profit from the status quo. If there is a silver lining to this current economic crisis, and from where I sit, it is awfully difficult to find one, it is that America may now finally be ready to find a new path and to face the tough questions we have ignored for so long. I believe that new path starts with a cap on carbon pollution. By driving massive new private investment into clean energies, in industries, a cap offers us the chance to create jobs. And not just high-tech positions making solar cells or exotic technology, but the kind of blue-collar jobs that could revive a town like Braddock or Akron or Detroit. Jobs making 250 tons of steel or 8,000 parts it takes to make a wind turbine jobs making new windows like they do in an old factory in Vandergrift, Pennsylvania, a factory that was shut down and but revived to make those very windows, or LED lights like ma they make in North Carolina and export to China, or one of the thousands of other products they will take to build this new energy economy. The government investment in clean energy and recovery in the Recovery Act was a good start, but we will not truly transform this economy until we spur the private sector into action. This nation is full of entrepreneurs, investors, inventors, and steelworkers prepared to jumpstart a true energy revolution. 
And this will only happen once you pass a cap on carbon pollution. To win the most jobs and the most economic opportunity, we must be a market leader in these new products and technologies. And a cap on carbon in the U.S. will spur our companies to be the early movers in these new markets, supplying solutions at home and selling these solutions across the globe. So I respectfully ask this Congress to please be bold, to overhaul our economy and free us from our addiction to imported oil. I ask you to ignore the scare tactics of the well-funded interest and to answer a call of Braddock to build a new energy future and a new American century with the ready hands of America's workers. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Fetterman, very much. Our next uh, witness is uh, uh, Paul Sissio. He is the President of the Industrial Energy Consumers of uh, America, a trade association of manufacturing sector companies. Uh, could you push over just a little bit, Mr. Knobloch? That would be great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeCicio, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking and Member Upton. Members of the committee, the Industrial Energy Consumers of America is the only trade association in the United States whose members are exclusively from the manufacturing sector, energy intensive and cross sector. Our companies employ over 850,000 employees nationwide. Manufacturing is the only sector of the economy that has a long history of significant investment in energy efficiency. Our greenhouse gas emissions are only 2.6 percent above 1990 levels, while other sector emissions are up about 30 percent. We provide the majority of co-generated electricity for the country, which is over 100 percent more energy efficient than electric utility production. We are leaders, national leaders, in the use of recycled steel, aluminum, glass and paper, which is also extraordinarily energy efficient. Our products provide the building blocks necessary to grow the economy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions when our customers use our products. We are a model for doing the right thing for business and the environment. Unfortunately, we do not see provisions in the bill that either reward us for our past energy efficiency actions, use of combined heat and power, or recycling, or encourage us to do more. This is a shortcoming of the bill. We have several key points. Number one, legislative provisions that are designed to preserve domestic competitiveness of the industrial sector and prevent jobs from moving overseas will create in our, concern, in our concern about retaliatory trade actions. Neither Congress nor the EPA can effectively regulate our offshore competitors through their actions. Number two, we should not impose unilaterally on U.S. manufacturing costs. A global agreement that addresses the industrial sector uniformly and in the context of fair trade and increasing productivity is the only way to avoid job losses. Number three, U.S. demand for our products will continue. It is just a question of whether they will be supplied domestically or imported. We compete in a global marketplace where pennies on the dollar can determine whether we win or lose with international competition. Unfortunately, as Mayor Fetterman said, from 2000 to 2008, imports are up 29 percent and manufacturing employment fell 22 percent, a loss of 3.8 million jobs. These numbers would indicate that we are losing that competitiveness battle. Number four, the provisions entitled Preserving Domestic Competitiveness provides for 85 percent of average needed allowances, without 100 percent allowances and without reimbursement for higher natural gas and electricity costs, we will lose competitiveness, relative competitiveness. Number five, increasing our greenhouse gas costs before comparable costs are placed on our competitors, our global competitors, will put competitiveness at risk. Countries like China and India have said they will not jeopardize their competitiveness, and neither should we. Congress must understand that when manufacturers from developing countries engage in international trade, 
they no longer have developing country excuses for not meeting comparable greenhouse gas reduction requirements and costs. Many of them are world-class competitors using the latest technology and they are owned by their governments and often they are subsidized. Number six, reducing our nation's greenhouse gas emissions from about 7 billion tons to 5 billion tons in a relatively short time period without a, and a readily available abundant supply of low-cost carbon that is affordable will drive up energy prices. Energy efficiency and renewable energy will help, but it will not close the gap. Carbon capture sequestration and nuclear will not be contributors over the next 10 years, which means the power sector will be dependent upon natural gas for power generation. Expansion of renewable energy means electric utility companies will be required to build natural gas-fired backup plants. It is extremely important to note that natural gas-fired power generation sets the marginal price for electricity. The implications are significant. As demand for natural gas goes up, prices go up, and electricity across the country. A double hit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cecil, uh, very much. You will have opportunities in the question and answer period to expand upon your thoughts. Our uh, next uh, witness is Mr. Uh, Kevin Knobloch. Uh, he is the President of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, he has more than 30 years of legislative and advocacy experience uh, and has served as the President of the Union of Concerned Scientists since 2003. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Knobloch. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Upton, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of the Union of Concerned Scientists. UCS is a national science-based nonprofit organization that has been working for a healthy environment and a safer world for 40 years. I applaud the leadership of this committee for moving this issue forward at this critical time. Today, I am pleased to share the results of a major study we have conducted over the last two years to examine the energy and economic implications of a comprehensive suite of energy, transportation, and climate policies that we call the Climate 2030 Blueprint. This comprehensive approach is similar to the one proposed by Chairman Waxman and Subcommittee Chairman Markey in their draft legislation. We used a modified version of the U.S. Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System for our analysis. Our results show that we can build a comprehensive and competitive 21st century clean energy economy that saves consumers and businesses money and gives our children a future without huge damaging costs of unchecked climate change. And this future is well within our technological and financial abilities. To highlight just a few of our major findings, our analysis found that by 2030, one, under the blueprint, our nation meets a carbon cap of 26, 20, 26 percent below 2005 levels by 2020 and 56 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. The electricity sector contributes more than half of the emission cuts in 2030. The transportation sector contributes the second largest area of emissions reductions. The blueprint policies will also cut mercury, acid rain, smog and soot pollution improving air and water quality and saving lives. Two, we can achieve these deep reductions in carbon emissions while saving American consumers and businesses $465 billion annually in 2030, while maintaining about the same rate of economic growth as the reference case. The blueprint builds $1.6 trillion in cumulative net savings between 2010 and 2030. Families will see an average household savings of $900 a year in 2030, while businesses will altogether save nearly $130 billion a year in the year 2030. Households and businesses in every region of the nation, even coal-dependent states and regions, will see lower energy bills. And third, we can cut the use of oil and petroleum products by 6 million barrels a day in 2030, as much oil as we currently import from the OPEC nations. We did not find that all of these benefits will come for free, but we found cost savings from reductions in energy use due to efficiency 
will more than offset the modest increase in energy prices and upfront investment costs. The key to this success is the comprehensive policy approach we modeled. The transportation policies get us cleaner cars, cleaner fuels, and better transportation options. The energy policies get us more efficient appliances, buildings, and industry, renewable energy, and more efficient uh, natural gas generation. A transparent and smartly designed cap and trade policy assures the emissions reductions the U.S. needs to help avoid the worst effects of global warming. This comprehensive approach is so critical that when we stripped out the sector-specific energy and transportation policies in our analysis, the cumulative savings for households and businesses in 2030 were reduced dramatically from $1.6 trillion to $600 billion. We have an historic opportunity to reinvent our economy, to make it more resilient and efficient, and to produce a bow wave of new high-quality jobs, especially in regions that have strong manufacturing capacity a seasoned, able labor force, and needed resources and infrastructure. In this new homegrown economy, we need people to build wind turbines, build carbon capture and storage infrastructure, weatherize and retrofit homes, install solar panels, and manufacture advanced cars and fuels, as well as to design, transport, maintain, repair, market, and sell all of the above. In my travels around the country, I hear a growing call for a new clean energy economy that is designed to also solve large, stubborn problems by reducing our dependence on oil, making us less vulnerable to blackouts, creating jobs, tackling climate change, and improving our families' health. We know that if we continue down a path of no action, our risks and vulnerabilities will increase, leading to significantly higher costs than if we act boldly today. The uh, waxman markey legislation is a strong start onto this path and onto this uh, clean energy future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knobloch, very much. Our next uh, witness is Dr. Stephen Haywood, uh, who is the F.K. Weyerhaeuser Fellow in Law and Economics at the American Enterprise Institute and a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute. We welcome you, Dr. Haywood. Right, thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Upton. Um, you know, I don't relish being in the role of a naysayer, partly because it goes against my own optimistic nature, and I tend to be something of a techno-optimist. I, I have a lot of excitement about things I see going on in the areas of energy research and development. Can you move the microphone just a little bit closer? Yeah. Yes. That's usually not a problem in my voice. Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm an optimist about a great many things. However, I, I do find myself troubled by an awful lot of, of what I think is sort of wishful thinking and too much, I'll just put it casually, happy talk about the matter. I mean, the last panel I kept hearing that there's nothing but win-win situations out there in the world. Uh, and it seems to me that we seem to feel that we can repeal the laws of economics and the laws of physics at the same time. It, it may be quite true that for certain industries and certain companies, uh, you do quite well if you give them allowances to emit carbon for free. Uh, but it does seem to remind me of that uh, remark of Charlie Wilson from the Eisenhower era, that uh, uh, to paraphrase his remark, it's not clear that what's good for GE is good for America. Uh, well, I, I prepared uh, my analysis today in this sort of confusing schedule, more tailored for the next panel about green jobs, but a couple of general comments. Um, it seems to me the difficulty here is that, on the one hand, we want to make carbon more expensive, but on the other hand, we don't want anyone to pay higher costs for it. Um, to the extent that we have lots of rebates and give away free allowances, it will mitigate the reductions you're likely to get from it. It would be, to use a simple analogy, as if we decided to try and reduce cigarette smoking by raising the tax on cigarettes, but then rebated the tax back to smokers at the end of the month. I don't think that would be very effective or would certainly reduce its effectiveness. Um, a couple of observations here. Um, it seems to me there are three questions to answer or to ponder more deeply. One is, is would a green jobs policy or, or narrow RPS mandates, I say narrow because, um, for example, the U.S. Conference of Mayors report on green jobs includes jobs in the nuclear industry as green jobs, yet the nuclear industry is conspicuously excluded from non-carbon sources contemplated in the draft discussion. But would a green jobs policy and uh, renewable mandates uh, result in net employment gains and net economic growth in the absence of, of such policy? Of course it's true in the ordinary sense that when the federal government spends more resources either directly through appropriations or indirectly through tax breaks and subsidies and mandates, you will generate employment where little or none existed before. 
just as our very large spending over the decades for defense spending generated a lot of employment where it didn't exist before. But I would think the example of defense spending is one we'd want to ponder a little bit. It's precisely the reason we don't see defense spending as a route to permanent prosperity. It's because it does not necessarily add productive and self-sustaining capacity to the private economy. Now, there's a lot of academic literature. I've made some reference to it in the statement I've submitted to the committee, and I won't repeat it all here. A lot of academic literature uh, calling into questions a lot of the analysis and assumptions of the green jobs ideas. Um, I think I'll just skip over that in the interest of time and getting to your questions and say that um, I think, uh, a summary statement, in the fullness of time, uh, we are going to look back on this period, say 20 or 30 years from now, uh, as the climate policy equivalent of wage and price controls to fight inflation back in the 1970s. Or maybe to pick a, an example that's a little closer to home, the Graham-Rudman approach to cutting the deficit in the late 1980s. And we're going to decide on some fundamentally different approaches uh, to tackling this problem. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Haywood, very much. Our next witness is Dr. David Kreutzer, who is the Senior Policy Analyst in Energy Economics and Climate Change at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis. He uh, previously taught economics at James Madison University, uh, where he served as the Director of the International Business Program. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Um, I'll read the disclaimer first at the risk of being redundant. My name is David Kreutzer. I am the Senior Policy Analyst in Energy Economics and Climate Change at the Heritage Foundation. The views I express in this testimony are my own. It should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee for this opportunity to address you concerning the economic impacts of cap-and-trade policies. Cap-and-trade is a tax. It artificially restricts access to fossil fuels that provide 85 percent of our nation's energy. This restriction drives up energy costs, drives down income, and drives jobs away. Today I will discuss several of the most critical economic impacts. Last year, the Center for Data Analysis at the Heritage Foundation projected the costs of the Lieberman-Warner climate change bill. The emissions target for the Lieberman-Warner bill was a 70 percent cut by the year 2050. It should be clearly noted that our analysis could only project for the first 20 years, at which point the carbon reduction scheme is only halfway to this 70 percent reduction goal. The first impact is on national income. Between 2012 and 2030, gross domestic product, the broadest measure of national income, drops by nearly $5 trillion after adjusting for inflation. The second impact is the tax transfer. Coincidentally, it is also $5 trillion. So you have a $5 trillion reduction in the size of the pie, and from that pie you cut another $5 trillion piece to spread around. <clears throat> this money is transferred from energy consumers to the government or those lucky enough to be given the pollution permits, which are also known as allowances. The third and arguably most painful impact is on employment. Employment drops overall, but the energy-intensive manufacturing sector is especially hard hit. By 2030, manufacturing employment loses nearly 3 million jobs because of cap-and-trade's energy restrictions. A map included in the written testimony shows that this impact will be uneven, as manufacturing is relatively more important to the economies of some states than it is to others. Though some of those who lose or never get manufacturing jobs will find employment in the service sector, Overall, unemployment rises by over 800,000 in some years due to the effects of cap and trade. Another point to note is that these job losses are net of any green jobs created by CO2 restrictions. In the written testimony is a copy of a page from the May 1945 issue of Mechanics Illustrated. It shows what we would call a green job in post-war Paris, a cyclist powering an electric generator. This was an imaginative solution to a lack of coal-generated current done by an ingenious beauty shop operator, perhaps. Today, a human-powered generator could produce about 10 cents of electricity in an eight-hour shift. Now, I don't think anybody's proposing that, but with sufficient subsidies, we could induce people to ride and pedal generators. The problem, of course, is that it moves human labor from producing output worth over $50 per day, and that would be at minimum wage, to producing something worth only 10 cents per day. 
Yes, we could point to the people riding these bicycle generators and count them as green jobs created, but the overall impact is to reduce economic output by at least $50 per day per person. Energy sources that require subsidies are energy sources that use inputs whose value is greater than the value of the output. Just as subsidizing a cyclist to generate 10 cents of electricity per day will not expand the economy, forcing energy to flow through uneconomic bottlenecks is not a stimulus. Rather, it will reduce income. In summary, we find the first two decades of a 40-year program to cut CO2 by 70 percent will lead to $5 trillion of lost gross domestic product, will increase energy taxes by another $5 trillion, will lead to 3 million lost manufacturing jobs and 400 to 800,000 fewer over jobs overall, even after accounting for green job creation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bruce, very much. Uh, our next uh, uh, witness is Dr. Nathaniel Cohen. Is it Dr. Cohen? Yes. Cohan? Cohan. Um, Director of Environmental Economic Policy and Analysis for the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, Dr. Cohan uh, oversees EDF's analytical work on the economics of climate change and helps develop its policy positions on global warming. Uh, formerly, he was an associate professor of economics at the Yale School of Management. Uh, we welcome you, Doctor. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the distinguished members of the committee for holding this hearing. Um, I'm uh, very honored to be here today. The climate crisis is our responsibility, and it is within our power to address it. We can easily afford strong action. What we cannot afford is more delay. The catastrophic consequences of unchecked climate change may seem remote, but they will happen within the lifetimes of my children and grandchildren. If we fail to address this problem, we must be willing to tell our children we could have addressed this crisis for a little over a dime a day per person, but we chose not to. My message today is simple. The most expensive climate change policy is not having one at all. The economic costs of unchecked climate change are real, and they will be severe. Fortunately, the best available economic analysis shows that the U.S. can easily afford the pollution cuts necessary to solve this problem. In my written testimony, I present results from a range of economic forecasts published last year by government and academia, analyzing earlier proposed legislation. Just yesterday, though, the Environmental Protection Agency released new results that specifically analyze the draft legislation released by this committee. And I'd like to highlight some of those results for you now. First, EPA's new analysis shows that our economy will grow strongly under the proposed bill before you today. Their study estimates that if Congress passes climate legislation this year, U.S. economic output will be 71 percent larger in the year 2030 than it is today. The difference between that amount and what the analysis estimates will happen if we do nothing about climate change amounts to half a percent to a little over 1 percent of GDP in that year 2030. To put that in perspective, if the economy, if the American economy will reach $23 trillion in January of 2030, if we do nothing to address climate change, it will get there by April or June at the latest with a carbon cap. Now, so far I've been telling you about the cost of climate policy, the estimated cost compared to business as usual. But in reality, the business as usual scenario in these models doesn't exist. It's a fantasy land in which there are no economic costs of unchecked climate change, and we all know that there's no such future. So these models that I'm talking about just look at one side of the ledger, the costs of action, but not the benefits of avoiding, the, the climate, uh, of avoiding climate change and its consequences. So still looking at that one side of the ledger, what are the costs for the average American family? EPA gives us a clear sense of what those are likely to be, and they are small. The average estimated cost to households in the year 2015 is just $14 to $75 per year, uh, sorry, in that year in present value. That's 4 to 21 cents a day um, over the entire life of the bill. The annual cost is just $98 to $140 per household. That's 27 to 38 cents a day for the average American family 
or 11 to 15 cents a day per person. That includes all of the estimated costs of this bill, now uh, of the cap and trade program on carbon. Now, you might say it's just one study, but in truth, this study is completely consistent with everything else we know. As my written testimony describes in detail, the consensus among credible economic analysis is that the American economy will grow robustly while cutting carbon pollution and investing in a clean energy economy. Now, I'm sure we're going to hear lots of numbers in the next few weeks that have been cherry-picked from reports issued by whatever modelers for hire can be found to support the latest or the desired point. Forecasts aren't crystal balls. They are only as good as the assumptions that go into them. And some of the assumptions used to get some of the numbers you may have heard are just simply not credible. The EPA, in its analysis, has set the gold standard in this report by using two of the most credible, transparent, and peer-reviewed models available. And the bottom line from that analysis is that for around 13 cents a day, and I brought 13 cents with me, around 13 cents a day we can solve climate change, help get our economy off foreign oil, and invest in a clean energy economy. As I said in the beginning, the climate crisis is our responsibility, and it is within our power to address it. We can easily afford strong action. What we cannot afford is more delay. Thank you for inviting me to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. And our final witness, uh, Myron uh, Ebell, is the Director of the Energy and Global Warming Policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He also chairs the Cooler Heads Coalition. Uh, we welcome you to uh, a place that needs that, uh, Dr. Ebell. Uh, thank you for your leadership in that area. Mr. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, for inviting me to testify here today. Uh, before I begin, let me say that I refer to several studies and articles in my uh, very short testimony, and I'd like to ask that they be submitted for the record. Without objection? Great. Uh, thank you. So what? Uh, my name is Myron E. Bell, and I'm Director of Energy and Global Warming Policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I am speaking here today on behalf of CEI. We oppose this bill. We hope it, it will be defeated, and we will do uh, whatever we can within our limited resources to defeat it. Uh, rather than uh, summarize my very brief testimony, I would like to just respond to several things I've heard today. Um, this morning, with the administration witnesses, we heard uh, some astonishing claims in, in very matter-of-fact uh, conversational answers, that this bill will create jobs, that it will reduce our dependence on foreign oil, and that it will help the economy. I believe Dr. Chu and Administrator Jackson uh, said that several times, and I think uh, Secretary LaHood said it at least once. Um, I think that each one of these is wrong, and certainly each one of these claims is, is arguable. Uh, I'm not much for modeling. I, don't, I think it depends, as Dr. Cohan said, it depends on what the assumptions are, and you can get almost any answer you want out of a climate model or an economic model. I would rather look at historical experience. We have many of the policies in your draft bill, Chairman Markey, uh, being tried today and have been tried for several years in the European Union and in California. California is falling off an economic cliff. Now, it's not the only reason that they have run up the price of energy so that they have the highest gasoline taxes in the nation. They have a shortage, a continuing shortage of refined gasoline that they have among the highest electric rates in the nation, com comparable with yours in Massachusetts. But it is one of the reasons that their economy is falling off a cliff. They used to have a very substantial energy-intensive manufacturing sector. They used to produce aircraft. They used to produce armaments. They used to produce a lot of automobiles. Uh, they used to have a steel mill and an iron mine. All of that is gone. Now, that has made them less carbon intensive. They don't produce as many emissions, but they still consume all those things. They just buy them from out of state. Somebody has to still produce stuff. So I am very skeptical of these claims. Now, the second panel from the U.S. 
Climate Action Partnership, and I have some very harsh things to say about the members of the Climate Action Partnership in my testimony, it seems to me that these are guys on the make. They want to get rich off the backs of American consumers, and they want you to enable them to do it. And I would, I would urge you to take a, a step back from the astonishing statement in your, in your uh, executive summary, which the committee put out on this bill, that says that this Title III, the cap and trade program, was designed with, uh, to conform to the recommendations of the Climate Action Partnership. And I would also ask to submit for the record, and I'm sorry he's not here, a letter from Chairman Waxman in 2004 to the administrator of the EPA complaining about this very thing when it was revealed that an EPA rule had been written with the cooperation of outside businesses and their lobbyists from a well-known DC law firm. Uh, and I think Chairman Waxman was exactly right then, and I would hope that you would, you would think this over again. Now, um, Mr. Rogers said that this will all work if we have a well-designed program. I would like to ask you, in your experience, how many government programs that have been enacted in your time in Congress have been well-designed? I would just like you to keep that in mind as you consider this enormous, huge, hit on the American economy and, what, and, and, and how easy it will be to design it so that it's well designed. I just can't see it. Now, Mr. Barton asked, uh, and since he isn't here, I will answer his question, do you favor 100 percent auctioning? Would you still favor this bill? Well, I will still oppose this bill, but I do favor 100 percent auctioning. I think that 100 percent auctioning of the rationing coupons removes a tremendous amount of the opportunity for gaming the system, uh, conning, uh, con games, and corruption. And so I would encourage you all to vote for an amendment that would have 100 percent auctioning. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ebell, very much. You hit, hit the, the number right on the minute. Uh, let me turn now and recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for a round of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I wasn't going to ask Mr. Ebell uh, any question, but I, where did all those jobs go that left California? Um, I, you know, I think most of them uh, went either abroad or to the heartland states that have lower energy prices, lower taxes. Uh, a less uh, stringent regulatory atmosphere and have, uh, you know, I, I remember when uh, Dr. John Christie from the University of Alabama at Huntsville testified, I think before this committee, and he said, you know, California used to have a vibrant auto industry, but in 2008, more automobiles will be assembled in Alabama than any other state. We have workers uh, who want to work, and we have and lower Mr. Abel, the reason I ask is, look, this is the obvious, and we go round and round on these things, and I really don't get something as fundamental as why, why some jobs leave certain areas. Sometimes it's just that uh, <clears throat> there are certain concerns that are addressed in certain areas that may not be in others, and it increases the cost of labor, um, such as fair wages, a living wage, mm -hmm. safe working conditions, small things like that. I'm sure this country could still be incredibly productive at uh, incredibly low cost had we maintained something like slavery or maybe just forgotten about uh, child labor or safe working conditions or minimum wage. There's all sorts of ways to reduce cost. I would like to think that we have matured and developed as a country where sometimes we just do that which is fair, equitable, and right, even though it may increase the cost. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a fundamental philosophical difference, I think, that, that's going on here. But let's just get to the matter at hand. Dr. Cohen and, and Dr. Crutzer, the only thing that you all share is the first letter of your last names, because obviously it seems, Dr. Crutzer, you simply don't believe that there's a need to act on greenhouse gas emissions. Would that be a fair statement? I want to start off with that. I mean, I really want your honest answer because I thought we debated that, I thought we were past it. But if that is your premise, then it goes to the very heart 
of maybe some of your opinions. Do you believe my, my, we should be taking any action on reducing greenhouse gas emissions? I, I can only talk about the ones that are being proposed in, 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 the, in this bill and elsewhere. No, no. I, cost, well, let's forget about this bill. Should we be addressing it in any form or fashion? If it's free, yeah. Okay. Well, why not? But it's not free. That's the problem. And it, and, and, so what would uh, be the Dr. alternative? Dr. Carney said it, that this bill would solve the, the climate change problem. It doesn't even come close to having All right, so a, a you're noticeable just, impact. It is the approach that you object to, but you believe, I, as your I, colleague I don't, next I don't, to you believes, that truly gas house gas emissions or greenhouse gas emissions truly pose a problem and one they, that needs they don't, to be addressed. They don't pro, I, I don't think there is enough evidence to say there is catastrophic problems coming down the road from greenhouse gas emissions. All right. All right. You know, there, there will be some increase in sea level. There will be some without greenhouse, without man-made greenhouse gas emissions rising. There will be some when we cut it back by, uh, you know, 70 percent or 80 percent. All right. And I would, I would like to have an economy that is strong enough that when we have the climate variability that we are going to have with or without climate action, that we have an economy that is strong enough to, to get through it, as we have done for the past couple of hundred years. We are getting stronger and stronger. We are going to be able to handle a, a foot and a half of sea level rise. And we are not going to stop it with this bill. And that is the problem. It is huge costs, very little benefits. And I wish this committee would look at what is the benefit. If you, this is not denier math. This is not flat earth math. This is not man never went to the moon math. The IPCC says that a doubling of CO2 emissions will lead to a two to four and a half degree increase in world temperature. The EPA, looking at the Lieberman-Warner bill, said that bill would lower greenhouse gas emissions from about 719 parts per million to about 695. Ask, Dr. That's a 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 But what you are saying is we have plenty of time and whatever is inevitable is something we could handle along the way as long as we, we have a strong, robust economy. Now, mm -hmm. if you were wrong, what might be the consequence of too little, too late? And would you be, be able to even address the adverse effect at a, at a later date? We would be able to address that at a later date if All it right. becomes clear. That's that when I want to go to doc, Dr. Kohan. Do, do you agree with any of those basic premises? One, that it really doesn't pose a danger. We don't need immediate action if, as and when, we'll be able to deal with it. Uh, it won't surprise you to know, uh, Congressman, that I don't agree with those premises. I think the uh, I'm not a scientist, but uh, I read the science and I talk to scientists, and I think the science is clear that if we don't do anything about climate change, the consequences will be catastrophic, um, that unchecked climate change is going to lead to severe and real economic damages. I mean, uh, Dr. Kreitzer says uh, that, uh, solve, that, that addressing it won't be free. The thing that won't be free, the thing that's really going to cost us is uh, the damages from climate change if we don't do anything about it. Uh, this is a problem where we are not taking account of those costs at all in what we are doing right now, um, and that is the most important problem that we have to solve. Now, if this is a global problem, and this is a problem that will uh, require concerted international uh, action to address, but the U.S. is part of that community, and we need to take the lead, and that is what this bill would do. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your patience today. I, this has been absolutely fascinating to listen to and to hear the, the different opinions. Uh, Mr. Sissio, I think I want to start with you because I appreciated what you said. Uh, we should not jeopardize our competitiveness. Well, absolutely. And we we should not. Uh, our organization and our companies have done a incredibly great job of continuing to reduce their energy consumption because it it's, makes us more competitive. And higher costs are okay, but you have got to have higher costs on our competitors overseas or we lose the jobs. Well, and I would like to come, I would like for you just to touch on what you think the electric industry will do to achieve efficiencies and meet the um, 
renewable electricity standards that are in the proposed legislation, how you balance that and how we still remain globally competitive with goods? Well, the, re the renewable portfolio standard uh, is only one part of the challenge of higher electricity costs. Uh, for one, uh, paper companies, which are some of my companies, use that, use renewable energy, the biomass, as a raw material feedstock. And if uh, electric utilities are utilizing that uh, to meet the standard, uh, it could put the paper business the industry out of business. Okay. Uh, but states are endowed with different renewable resources, and that's why our view is that uh, that should that is the decision that should be made at the state level, where they know how much renewable resources are available and at what cost. And can make those appropriate adjustments. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Kurtzer, I, when I was talking with Mr. Chu and questioning him earlier today, I asked him about the 25 percent standard and working toward that by 2025. And he said it was going to be easily achieved. So do you agree or uh, disagree with that? Well, it's, it's going to be costly. Um, we, we actually, in our analysis, we gave that away. We said, let's assume that all of the renewable standards set up by the states can be met at reasonable cost. So when we did our analysis of Lieberman Warner, this very difficult to achieve standard, we said we're going to meet that. Still, $5 trillion worth of lost GDP in 20 years, $5 trillion worth of energy taxes, 3 million lost manufacturing jobs. All of that was even though we assumed we could meet the renewable portfolio standard that was a little bit less but close to 25 percent. Okay. Um, Mr. Hayward, uh, when I had talked with uh, Secretary LaHood, I, I asked him about and then subsequently Mr. Chu about the low carbon fuel standard and the effect on prices at the pump. And as we look at uh, transportation fuels, and will it lead to uh, greater or lessened dependence on foreign oil? Those are two issues that we hear a lot about from our constituents. Uh, they're concerned about the dependence issues. They're concerned about the price at the pump. So as you look at the uh, low carbon standards, uh, what, do you, what do you think? Oh, boy, I have a hard time making up my mind about that uh, because there's so many moving parts. Uh, I mean, the big, one of the big problems to try and solve in transportation is how do we have a portable fuel? I mean, that's why we want gasoline or diesel or biofuels or something. You want something to put in a tank or in an energy supply for a car. So we, we talk a lot over the years about hydrogen. We're talking about plug-in hybrids uh, with much bigger battery capacity. We're talking now about biofuels from algaes being talked about. Uh, the difficulty here is, is, once again, if the government tries to pick winners, you may actually clog up the market for innovation. I don't know that anybody's really happy about the way the whole ethanol business has gone, including most environmentalists. But yet, we're kind of path dependent on that now because you have a lot of powerful interests who don't want to change the program there. I think that's a good example and case study of how you can actually retard progress. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to keep an open mind about that, but that's, I think, very hard to predict how that's going well, to Well, but my constituents say, is this going to cost us more yeah. or is it going to save us money? So where do you think that's going to come down? In the short run, it's going to cost you more, cost I Cost more. Long okay. run, I don't think anyone can say. Thank you. I am out of time, Mr. Chairman. I've got a couple of other questions. I will submit those. And we will ask the witnesses to respond in writing to those questions. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I saw a recent analysis from Mr. Knobloch's group uh, that stated some interesting facts. In 2007 and 2008, more wind power was installed than in the previous 20 years combined, and more than 70 wind turbine component facilities opened, expanded, or were announced. The renewable energy, renewable energy standard, electricity standard that this legislation contains is an economic engine for the future. According to the Union of Concern, scientists, and RES would create 297,000 new jobs in renewable energy development. A robust RES will drive investment to the tune of $263.4 billion in cities and towns across this country. We can achieve these economic benefits even while taking the equivalent of 45.3 million cars off our roads. 
Mr. Knobloch, um, in my hometown of Sacramento, we are attempting to create a center of clean energy technology that will drive our local economy. And I visited a number of these new regional companies when I was back home last week. With this background, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the job creation components of this legislation. Can you expand a bit on what types of jobs will be created with this legislation? Thank you, Congresswoman. You know, the great thing about, about the renewable electricity standard debate is that we're not dependent on modeling. We can look at the 28 states that have adopted a renewable electricity standard. And the success of that policy is, has, has been tremendous. At least half of those states have gone back before um, uh, before the, the time limit for, for, for the uh, increased percentage of renewables and increase the percentage because they were doing so well. A state like Texas, uh, 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 years ahead of the, the, uh, when the, the time, of the time frame, went in and doubled, uh, doubled the amount of uh, uh, renewables that they would expect from that policy. And now Texas is, of course, the national leader in wind power uh, and has uh, three times the installed uh, uh, wind electricity of, of the state of California. Um, and, and you can also look to before there was any re renewable electricity standard policies, the renewable sector was floundering. And so here, w what, what happened was, was that government came in, set a standard, did not pick win winners and losers, technological winners and losers, it did define what is renewables. And there are some very legitimate uh, debates going on as to what, what belongs in there. Now, some opponents of this legislation argue that new jobs would only be created because other jobs would be lost. In the case of RES, is this a zero-sum game when it comes to jobs, or are there hundreds of thousands of jobs it creates going to be on top of the existing job figures? Well, this analysis that you're referring to, uh, uh, which is not part of our blueprint, it was separate analysis, showed that, that uh, uh, the renewable sector, that a national renewable electricity standard would create three times the number of jobs that would be created uh, in the same time span in the fossil fuel sector. So it, it, it nets out positive uh, when, it's, when it's well designed. It, when you, when you li listen to any kind of jobs analysis, you want to be sure that, that there's, there's a control for what's happening in, in the economy already and, and get your, your arms around that. But uh, we're quite confident that uh, uh, whether it's uh, 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 you know, the, the, the steel workers in Pennsylvania who, who uh, got laid off and are now building uh, towers for wind turbines, um, truckers, people who pour concrete, um, uh, people who uh, uh, design wind turbines and the associated machinery. There, there's, there's dozens of different job disciplines that go into making this technology. I'd like to turn to uh, something that uh, is really something in our, my district, I represent the most at-risk river city in the nation in Sacramento, and uh, studies have seen that the Sierra Nevada snowpack would disappear under a business-as-usual scenario. Um, so that represents great challenges to my district. Uh, this is to Dr. Cohane. Um, with this in mind, will you please expand on the point you made in your testimony that the threat from water-related impacts to climate change could be in the billions of dollars? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I, that was a uh, quote from a study uh, that uh, Frank Ackerman uh, at Tufts University did uh, as part of just looking at four uh, analyses or, or four types of impacts on the United States, one of them being increased water scarcity. Uh, and uh, when they added up uh, all those uh, four analyses uh, or all those four costs, the other were increased energy costs and coastal flooding, which uh, is, is important in other areas of the country, and, uh, and also increased hurricane intensity. They got uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in costs from unchecked climate change. That's what we would pay in business as usual. That's why I said it wasn't free not to do anything about this. And that's just from those four costs. That excludes uh, a huge other number of damages. So that's, it, it, that, that kind of concern uh, that is going to be the water scarcity is going to be relevant to the American West, and there are going to be other concerns that are relevant to other parts of the country. Well, thank you. I see my time is up. The gentle lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'm delighted that this is the last panel. We've had eight hours uh, almost. This is uh, not today. the last panel. Today it is the last panel today, right? No, one more to no, go. There isn't another panel. There's not another panel. There is? There is. This is an all you can eat. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's all you can eat. It's no. Who's on the today. fourth panel? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. 
I'll stay. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, my time really shouldn't be running. I was going to say that I was. Let's start. We're going to start. We're going to start. The, the gentleman was a little bit disoriented. I really didn't realize that. No. Well, I, I have this big list. I just didn't turn the page, but there it is. Um, I was going to say that I, I, I am looking forward to co-hosting with you tonight with Disney, uh, the show uh, Earth. Uh, Perhaps you'll be hosting it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Is there another panel after this? No, no, no. <laughs> we'll they actually have a, a the, detail for us uh, in, yeah. in terms of uh, our remarks tonight, so maybe I'll get your time. Anyway, I, uh, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, for me, I, I do want to see uh, emissions reduced. Uh, I want to see plenty of incentives uh, to, pro to provide uh, cleaner energy for all of our citizens, uh, but I also want it to be fair. Uh, and I don't want to put the U.S. at a big disadvantage. And the headlines that I cited in my opening statement eight, some eight hours ago, uh, with India and China not willing to, to participate in every opportunity that they've been given, uh, whether it's before this committee in the last year or now in public statements, I think puts our nation at a, at a severe disadvantage. Uh, and it's not that we're going to do nothing. Uh, we're going to do a lot. Uh, whether it's with energy ap appliance standards, it's with building standards, it's with lighting standards, it's uh, with auto standards, it's, there, is, there is a lengthy list that, in fact, we are going to do a lot to reduce our emissions. And when I look at, again, what I cited this morning, and that we've had, in essence, uh, comparable growth, the United States and the EU. They had a cap-and-trade uh, scheme. They desperately want us to, to participate uh, with them because their emissions went up while ours went down. Uh, there was significant leakage, I think, of jobs. Their, their energy prices did go up. And when we hear from the chairman of AEP, who testified at some point in the last uh, couple of weeks that they thought that their energy prices in Ohio would go up 40 to 50 percent because Ohio uses more than 90 percent coal, and we know that that's the same for Indiana. Michigan's about 60, 65 percent. Those costs get passed along. And yes, you can help with it with the subsidies, I guess, run a little bit along the lines of LIHEAP for low-income individuals so that they don't bear the brunt of that higher cost. And Dr. Hayward, I loved your example on cigarettes. But the jobs don't stay. Not when they can go someplace else at a lower cost, knowing that they are competing in a global economy. And so we, what we want to do is, is uh, and there's no off-ramps uh, from my read of this uh, legislation. Yeah, there's some discussion uh, with the idea of allowing us to have an import fee uh, that somehow would be WTO uh, uh, amenable. But again, the jury's out. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to work or not. I have a feeling, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to have a vote on whether or not the administration ought to have a 100 percent auction here. Uh, I know the administration supported that in the testimony that they gave in, in the first panel today. Uh, we'll find out where the votes are, whether that ought to be part of the package, and what happens if, in fact, it's, it's uh, uh, an amendment that is, that is adopted. Uh, Mr. Ebo, your comments, I think, were right on line as, as we look at uh, the costs associated and, and what is going to happen to, to businesses. Uh, but how do, uh, how do you counter that with Dr. Keown's, uh, is that, am, am I saying that right, Keown? It's not right. Cohan, but it's close. Cohan, all right. Is it spelled right? On the, uh, all right. Uh, I mean, how, how do you comport that your, your two testimonies together? Dr. Cohan says that it's going to be 7 to 10 cents a day. And yet we, we hear some pretty different numbers when we actually go into the field, at least as we look at the Midwest. Uh, thank you, Representative Upton. Um, I appreciate your leadership on this issue. Um, we know it can't be that inexpensive. If it were that inexpensive, we wouldn't be having these rancorous debates. The fact is that energy prices have to go up significantly if emission cuts are going to be made. Uh, president Obama recognized this when he was running for president, and he said, under my plan of a cap-and-trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Peter Orzag, now the uh, head of OMB, right. uh, then head of CBO, when he testified here, said, this won't work unless prices go up. 
In the European Union, there has been tremendous consternation about the, the price of the rationing coupons because they yo-yo up and down, and the, the people who want to uh, who are actually serious about making emissions cuts keep pointing out that the price has to stay up in order to force emissions down. When, the, when it keeps yo-yoing up and down, nobody has an incentive to reduce their emissions because they're going to hope that they're going to get some cheap rationing coupons, uh, you know, if not this month, next month. So I just think it is, it, it is beyond believability that this is going to be inexpensive. Uh, it's, it's going to be incredibly expensive. I'm going to the answer. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, with all due respect, I don't. I'm not quite sure how Mr. Ebel knows um, that it can't possibly be as uh, inexpensive as the best analysis we have from the best economic models we have, uh, which is what the EPA analysis represents. Um, that's what those models estimate. Now, sure, there are. Uh, you know, the models aren't perfect, but if you look at the record, we've always overestimated the costs of environmental regulation. That was a finding by some researchers at Resources for the Future who looked at, uh, who found a consistent pattern of, of overestimation. And that's because, frankly, we don't know how to model technological change. And these models, these analyses, can't capture the scope of technological change that we'll see when we use a market-based system that unlocks American innovation. Well, just to close, because my time has expired, it seems like, uh, based on what you just said, maybe we ought to have an amendment that would offer a safety valve that if it goes up more than 20 cents, the, the whole thing will be struck after the enacting clause. Maybe we'll see an amendment like that. Thank you. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the – gentleman is – the chair is uncertain here. Well, I'm going to continue to recognize uh, members of the minority. Okay. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. We can go to Mr. Shimkus if you like, Mr. Hall. I'm sorry that I haven't been here because it seems like you all are having so much fun in here when I got here. Yeah. I'll stay a while. I. Uh, I want to ask some questions, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me, and thank you for accepting that Washington Post item. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's my opinion and the opinion of most of us over here and the opinion of maybe half of you out there that uh, we're going to be in a weakened competitive position in the United States under cap and trade. I believe it deeply and have a lot of reasons to believe it. and and you all are in responsible positions and know more about your business than I know about your business, but I know your business, man, successful or you wouldn't be here. So I just can't see why you can't understand, if you don't understand, why we wouldn't be in a weakened competitive uh, position under cap and trade as it's written here. Uh, we, uh, I have a, the uh, chairman is a good friend of mine. I like the chairman. Uh, we uh, elect one another, I think. I criticize him in his district, and he criticizes me in mine. <laughs> but uh, we have a mutual understanding, and I respect him. I really do. And he's funny. Uh, but China, under the Washington Post, China hopes climate deal omits exports. Now this, this ought to tell you how China thinks and, and they're one of the big players. They're the big player in this other than us. And if they don't play, and I, I mentioned this this morning, it's a little bit maybe uh, simple, but when you go to Walmarts or, uh, or uh, Sears or, or your wives go to Neiman's or anywhere, you're going to see a machine as you, on your way out that you got to go buy that machine. It's called a cash register, and you have to pay, and somebody's got to pay. And China has never indicated in one instance that they want to pay their share, and they're polluting the air, as we sit here today, and I think I read the other day where about every sixth day they open a, a plant that uh, is uh, not conducive to, to clean air. Uh, and I'm very pro-coal. I'm, I'm pro-nuclear. Uh, I live in Texas. I'm a, we're fossil fuels there, and I don't know how, how we're going to do away with fossil fuels. Of course, we have to have technology and keep com 
continue to pursue cleansing. Uh, anybody in their right sense knows that. Uh, but anybody that thinks we can just overnight do away with fossil fuels is just dreaming. They're just thinking, uh, and, and it would be wonderful. But that hadn't happened, and, and elements here in Washington and around the country have fought us drilling offshore, fought us drilling in the, off the coast of uh, Florida, fought us from drilling up in Anwar. Uh, and we, could, we don't even have to have any help from anybody else. We have plenty right here at home if we could just mine it, and we should have. But we haven't. So we find ourselves in a position where it's, China, one of the big players, not only won't agree to, to curtail their polluting the skies, but I think they're insolent enough to indicate, and I'm going to read you a little bit from uh, this uh, Washington Post deal. It says, countries importing Chinese goods should be responsible for the heat trapping gases released during manufacturing, a top Chinese official said yesterday. That was Ling Geo. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but that's the way it looks to me. Anyway, he is the uh, climate change, uh, he directs the climate change department at the National Development and, and Reform Commission. So he's the top guy, so far as I know, over there. He's their top climate negotiator. And he said that, and he said, as one of the developing countries, we're at the low end of the production line for the global economy. We produce products, and these products are consumed by other countries. This share of emissions should be taken by the consumers, but not the producers. They're not even willing to pay for their own emissions. Now, please take that into consideration when you make your decisions. So uh, I'd ask this question, uh, what evidence do, and I'll begin over here, Mr. Ebel, I can't see that far, but Mr. What the hell's his name? Ebel. Mr. Ebel. That's what I thought it said, but I yes. couldn't pronounce it. Uh, what evidence does uh, U.S. CAP have that China and other developing nations will not take strategic advantage of what will be a weakened competitive position of the United States under cap and trade? Representative Paul, I don't believe that they have any uh, evidence, and in fact, I think uh, they do plan to take competitive advantage, and they also want to be paid for their emissions reductions. And I think you can uh, see how expensive it is going to be to reduce emissions because everyone believes it will be cheaper to reduce emissions in developing countries than it will be in the United States, and yet they are talking uh, in the European Union and in China and India about sending hundreds of billions of dollars a year to developing countries to reduce emissions. So the idea that the EPA model is believable, no, it doesn't pass the laugh test. But if I can, it's if I may. absolutely an indication, not an indication, it's just proof that they're not going to play fair with us and not going to take care of their emissions. Go ahead, sir. I, I just wanted to say, again, with respect to my fellow panelists, I think the best judges of the businesses uh, and, the, and the competitive positions of the U.S. CAP companies are those U.S. CAP CEOs and, and, and not Mr. Ebel. And I will say uh, there is in this bill, I think these uh, concerns you've laid out are, are real, but the bill has provisions uh, to deal with them. And I think the way forward is for the United States to do what it has always done best, which is to lead. And if we lead on this crucial issue, then we will be producing the next generation of low-carbon technologies here at home will be exporting them instead of importing them from others. The gentleman's time has expired. May I make one last statement to the gentleman? Yes, you may. The, the taxpayer, the, uh, the cash register that I spoke about in all of these countries, uh, China, Russia, they're going to walk, you're going to allow them to walk right by the cash register and leave it to the children of, that are unborn today taxes to fall on their backs. I don't believe you really want to do that. I yield back my time. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate uh, the hearing and being patient. I appreciate the panel for staying uh, as long as you have. Um, a couple things. I asked this question to an earlier panel. Um, does everyone ag agree that India does not have a low carbon fuel standard? Everybody is nodding in agreement with that. Does everyone agree? I'm just doing this for quickly so I can get to other questions. Does everyone agree that China does not have a low carbon fuel standard? 
Okay, everybody's shaking their head. Mayor, do you agree? <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, what about, uh, does everyone agree that uh, India currently is not under a cap and trade regime? Does everyone agree with that? And Mayor, you too? Okay. Uh, and, and does everyone agree that India is not under a cap and trade regime? Okay. Well, I, with heads nodding in assent. Um, the, uh, one of our problems is w that, and I've used this terminology numerous times, uh, all the pain and no gain, because there's really a debate about whether countries will comply. If our leadership will spur an international accord. So briefly, uh, do you agree that if we lead, China and India will comply to a low carbon fuel standard and a cap and trade regime? Real quickly, if you can get yes and no, Mr. Ebel, if you head first. Microphone. Be quickly, though, yes or no would be helpful. Yes, I think we can guarantee it if we put a provision in the bill saying it will not go into effect until there is an international agreement that has been ratified that is binding. And we, and we used to talk about that. We used to use the terminology of an off-ramp, but uh, that has been jettisoned. I, 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 Dr. I will, Cohen. I will Cohen. say if we do not do anything, uh, then they won't take a cap on their own. But if we do lead, uh, that's the only way we'll get No, will they? Yes or no, will they if we do lead? I guess is a question. You I believe they will? Do, I think if we do lead, China and India China will do it, and and India will both do low carbon fuels and a cap I, and trade. I think I I don't know what mechanism they'll use, but I think if we lead, we will see okay. China and India okay. follow. Great. On thank you, Mr. Doc. Uh, uh, Mr. Kreutzer. I don't think they will. They certainly won't accept the cap that the EPA assumes, which will be about half of the one we're getting. Okay, Dr. Hayward. I think it's very unlikely. Um, here's the problem. Uh, even in an optimistic scenario, a lot of low carbon technologies that we can afford as a rich country are still going to be more expensive than fossil fuels for developing countries, who, by the way, control about 80 percent of the world's fossil fuels. It takes quite a flight of fancy, it seems to me, to think that they're not going to use those fossil fuels, especially if they get cheaper on the world market as we use less of them. Okay. Mr. Nonluck. Uh, I think we're leaving a vacuum. I think if we lead, they will. China today has a national renewable electricity standard. They have fuel economy standards that are competitive. With they are also building a new power plant, whatever, that, that, a coal fire power plant every week. Yes, sir. That, that okay. is so. Okay. But, but if we don't lead, it's assured okay. that they won't. Mr. Chichios. But you think they will comply if we, have, if we move on both I think low we, carbon fuel and cap and trade regime? I think I think we lead and they and, and we, we lead boldly in negotiations and they and they accept a cap, then some of these policies will flow from there. We will okay, Mr. Chichio. Uh, I don't I don't I don't think so, and particularly for the industrial sector, which is their engine of jobs growth. So I don't think so. Mayor? I, I do believe they will eventually follow because the practices that they are currently engaging uh, will are not sustainable environmentally, and it will lead to an environment. Well, uh, yeah, and I would, and I don't want to debate you, but uh, carbon dioxide is not a toxic pollutant. Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, carbon dioxide is not a toxic pollutant. Would you agree with that? Uh, it, it is toxic in excessive amounts. It is not. To Does everyone, anyone believe that carbon dioxide is a toxic pollutant? At 15,000, and we're at in the atmosphere right now, 380. Okay. Let me let me uh, let me go and. Uh, so much discuss. Let me talk about real jobs for a second. Um, I, I just toured uh, a supercritical new coal-fired power plant um, in Lively Grove, uh, Washington County. Washington County has 15,000 employees. This power plant uh, is right now has 1,200 construction jobs, uh, an additional 400 uh, building a coal mine across the street. They'll have 500 full-time power plant jobs and 400 coal mine jobs once in operation. Those are real jobs that are at risk. Because what happens in carbon dioxide capture and sequestration, 40 percent, and I'll end with this, Mr. Chairman, 40 percent, 100 percent of the electricity output would then be cut to only 60 percent that can go on the market because it's going to take 40 percent of the energy created by this power plant to initiate the carbon capture and sequestration provision, thus limiting its ability to really get a return on the investment. Okay. Gentlemen's time has expired. 
Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, the ranking member of the full committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to ask. I don't think I'll take the full five minutes. Um, Mr. Sissio, is, is it your view that um, there should be no cap and trade program at all? Is that there a fair are, assessment? Uh, we, we uh, as an organization, have not taken a position either for or opposed. What we look at is cost effectiveness. Cost number one, cost number two, cost number three. Uh, in my testimony, I, I said that our industry has done an incredibly good job of continuing to drive down energy consumption and the resulting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, we do not support policies, any policy, a cap and trade policy or any other policy that is not cost effective. Well, then let me ask it a different way. Can you develop a cap and trade program that doesn't add cost to the economy? No, sir. I would say, in my opinion, that's not possible. Okay. Um, Mr. Hay Haywood, uh, it says that you're a warehouser fellow. That's a. Um, forestry company, um, do you think that we can reforest America with enough offsets to cover the um, allowances in a, if we had a cap and trade bill um, that didn't give away allowances? That's a it's a terribly complicated question. This house or chair at AEI is something the family set up over 30 years ago. At the same time, they set up a chair at Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. I don't do that much work on forestry, actually. I do the sludge part of the environment. Um, but I have to look at some numbers of this. Uh, we've actually been reforesting pretty rapidly in this country. Uh, a million acres a year net forest growth in the 1990s, according to a study the Clinton administration set in motion. Um, but uh, it's hard to get some numbers on this. But I think the, the general answer is no, you actually can't take up all of our carbon emissions through carbon sinks, or but some portion of them, and that I'm hesitant to, to give you a figure on that, but it's it's not anywhere near enough to the targets that we're setting out for. I think, Mr. Keon, do you want to answer that, or are you just looking at him? I'd well, I, I I was actually going to highlight the uh, enormous potential for helping to protect the tropical rainforests, and in doing so, uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions there, and uh, and help reduce costs here at home. Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to tropical rainforest protection. My problem with within the United States, if we set up an offset program, I'm reasonably confident that we can enforce it and implement it. I'm not as confident overseas. So my problem with the tropical rainforest is not that I don't want to protect them and I wouldn't even and I'd even be willing to figure out a way to give some credits if we could ensure that um, they would actually be enforced and implementable in those countries. I don't have that confidence level overseas. That's my problem with what you just said. Well, I, I, I agree that enforcement and verification is, is crucial, but I think we have the satellite monitoring and the on-the-ground monitoring to do that reliably. Okay, my last question, I'm going to ask this to my friend at the Heritage Foundation. Um, if we have a renewable energy standard or a clean energy standard, uh, should we include uh, nuclear power? Uh, yeah, I don't understand why that gets left out. If, if the goal is CO2 and CO2 is the worry, nuclear produces essentially zero CO2 per kilowatt what about, hour. What about clean coal technology? Um, clean coal technology, as uh, Mr. Shimk has pointed out, is pretty expensive. Right now we don't have, uh, the, those of us at Heritage, and I don't speak for Heritage, but I know that some of the people I talk with are, are doubtful that it will be commercially available any time in the next couple of decades. That's our but concern. But theoretically, it, it is the, at the, least the science is there, uh, but you have to do something in addition to pulling it out of the affluent. You have to put uh, essentially several super tankers per day worth of compressed uh, liquefied CO2 someplace. Thank you. Thank you I think Mr. that's a problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the gentleman very much. And we thank the panel for your expert uh, testimony and if you would, you, you please remain available because um, over the next several weeks we would like to rely upon your expertise. Thank you all so, so much for your expertise today. And uh, we are going to now uh, ask the, the next panel to uh, come up to uh, testify. 
uh, as well before the panel. Welcome, and uh, we appreciate very much our, um, our final panel for, uh, uh, for being seated here. And uh, we are going to begin uh, by uh, recognizing, excuse me, we're going to recognize first the, uh, Mr. Frank Ackerman. He is a senior economist from the Stockholm Environmental Institute uh, at uh, uh, Tufts University. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. And uh, based on prior travel arrangements, I will have to leave the room no later than 645. I can answer questions. Uh, I think we're going to be able to accommodate okay. you. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify on my research on the costs of climate change. This hearing comes at a crucial juncture not only because a new Congress and a new administration are beginning to make changes in climate policy. New initiatives are on the table in part because there has been a fundamental shift in the terms of the debate, with the controversy moving from science to economics. In the realm of science, the influence of an isolated handful of climate skeptics is rapidly waning. The world's scientists have never been so unanimous and so ominous in their warnings of future hazards. But while the climate science debate is approaching closure, the climate economics debate is still wide opening. Climate change is happening. It is threatening our future well-being. But how much can we afford to do about it? The most powerful argument for inaction today is the claim that the costs of reducing emissions would be intolerable. The damage to the economy, it is alleged, would be worse than the climate problem we are attempting to solve. Other witnesses have addressed the costs of climate policy. My testimony addresses the other side of the coin, the costs of inaction. Uh, Dr. Cohen mentioned this briefly in his uh, remarks in the last panel. W when it comes to climate change today, there is no longer any choice of avoiding all costs. The status quo is no longer an option. That is, the costs of climate change are not a discretionary purchase, like choosing whether to buy a new car this year or wait another year. It is more like a homeowner deciding whether it is time to repair the ever-widening cracks in the foundation of a house. The longer you wait, the more expensive it will be. Wait long enough and it may become impossible to save the House. My research shows that for the United States as a whole, even a partial accounting of the costs of inaction is well above 1 percent of GDP, rising steadily in dollars and as a percentage over time. For some parts of the country, such as Florida, a similar partial accounting of the costs of inaction in another study we did reaches 5 percent of state income within this century. For particularly vulnerable parts of the world, such as the islands of the Caribbean, the costs will be disastrously greater with one likely consequence being a much increased flow of refugees out of that region. Damages that will result from inaction include, but are not limited to, the impacts of increasingly severe hurricanes, more coastal property at risk from rising sea level and storm surges, increased energy costs for air conditioning as temperatures rise, growing scarcity and rising costs for water, losses in agriculture to hotter and drier conditions, and losses of tourism revenue as weather conditions worsen. Uh, my written testimony details these and has references to the detailed studies from which they are taken. Uh, rather than try to walk you through any of those calculations, I would like to take a minute to talk about what some of my newer research implies about an issue that came up in the last panel about competitiveness. I have been looking at the question of China's trade and its carbon intensity, and the remarkable fact is that China does not have a comparative advantage in carbon intensive goods. China's imports are as carbon intensive as its imports and as its exports in a sense more. China has a comparative advantage in low cost labor and they export things that are based on low cost labor which are not the carbon intensive products in the world economy. Uh, it, it is completely a mistake to think that concerns about competitiveness lead to thinking that China is going to rush ahead based on lower cost carbon. If we want to think about competitiveness and the environment, I think it would be more useful to think about the country that is really winning in world trade in most recent years, which is Germany. Germany has high wages, it has high energy costs, and it has a renewable energy standard. It is part of a cap-and-trade system. It is the world beater in terms of exports. And 
they don't seem to be crippled by those European environmental regulations. They have a big trade surplus in manufacturing. So not only is China not the winner in carbon intensive things, Germany has a lot of very carbon intensive exports, but it's not necessary to cut wages to the Chinese level, to cut environmental regulations back to the Chinese level. Why is it that you can lead the world in exports with European wages, regulations, and energy costs. I think that's the question that we ought to be looking at before we jump to any conclusions about what small changes in climate policy are going to mean for competitiveness. So uh, thank you. I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions if I'm still here or in writing if I have to leave. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ackerman, very much. Our next witness is Ms. Kate Gordon. She's the co-director of the National Apollo Alliance. We uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Turn on that microphone, please. Yeah. Thanks for your patience also in staying so late. I also am going to have to run out of here at some point, so for a flight. Um, this is a critical moment. You keep hearing this. We're, we're at a moment of climate crisis, but also economic crisis and also an equity crisis. We have an inequality at a high in this country, and everything has sort of converged. We really need to consider whether we're continuing with business as usual or whether we're looking at a new path where we can simultaneously achieve climate stability and energy security and economic prosperity. And this is, I think the bill in front of you is a, is a good and exciting step toward that, but also want to say it is critical at this moment that we take a comprehensive approach. It's not going to be enough just to regulate. Um, it, it, we need to take the kind of comprehensive approach that the countries that are beating us in this space, which I agree are the European countries, that those countries have taken. What those countries have done is to say, not only do we create the regulations that create demand in these sectors for clean energy and efficiency, they've also invested in their workforce. They've also invested in their manufacturing sectors. These countries have not succeeded and are not ahead of us because of lower wages and cheaper processors. They are processes. They're ahead of us because they have looked both to demand and supply when looking at clean energy and energy efficiency. We, uh, there's no guarantee, there's no magic pill that's going to create jobs from this bill if we don't take a comprehensive approach. There's no guarantee that, for instance, construction jobs and efficiency will be good jobs unless we put in prevailing wage standards and other guarantees. There's no guarantee manufacturing jobs will stay in the United States unless we invest in retooling and scaling up our manufacturing sector so that the 70,000 manufacturing firms today that are making the component parts that could be part of this supply chain, unless those firms can retool and retrain to be part of that supply chain. There's no guarantee that workers will be ready for the clean energy economy unless we invest in training programs that really help all Americans, including those without four-year college degrees, and I would just urge the committee to think about the workforce provisions of the bill and really expand those to include folks who are not in four-year colleges. The vast majority of the jobs that we've seen coming out of the green economy in manufacturing, construction, operations, and installation, the majority of those will be the kind of middle-skill jobs that are really most available to those with two-year associate degrees, with technical degrees. So really looking at those folks as well. We, uh, we've seen, I think, in some ways, the Recovery Act as a precursor to the kind of bill we're looking at today, to the, the, the way of doing comprehensive investment combined with workforce investment. That bill is already leading through its uh, sections on creating demand for efficiency and renewable energy. It is already leading to jobs throughout the country. Uh, in my testimony, written testimony, I talked about um, the, the company Serious Materials, which just, bought, uh, which just bought a Chicago window factory and is turning it into an efficient window factory, in part because of demand created by the Recovery Act for efficient products. We also have seen companies in other parts of the Midwest retool, uh, going from producing regular glass to efficient glass, going from producing gearboxes for tractors to gearboxes for wind turbines. This is already happening. And it will continue to happen. There's 100 stories from the Recovery Act. We could turn that into 1,000 or 10,000 stories from, from this type of bill. So we encourage you, as you're looking at the bill, to think big. Don't just think about you know, the cap and trade section. Don't just think about imported oil and uh, energy savings. Think about workers and the countless Americans who might finally be able to earn a living wage and be able to enter the middle class or be able to invent cutting edge technologies that will put us on the forefront of the clean energy future. We have, as a country, always come to crisis, come out of crisis stronger, and come out of crisis with new innovations and new leadership. And we can do that again. And I just encourage you to look beyond 
the, uh, the, 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 the individual pieces of this bill to where we want to go as a country and how we want to, want to be uh, competitive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gordon, very much. Our next witness, uh, Denise Bodie, is the CEO of the American Wind Energy Association. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Markey. We look it's forward nice to your to testimony. Here. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking um, you all for drafting the American Clean Energy Security Act. It's an important step forward. In my testimony, I'll focus on all aspects of it, but my oral testimony, I want to focus on the wind industry's top priority, and that is early passage of the renewable electricity standard and what it means to jobs, good manufacturing jobs, as well as electric generation jobs in the United States. Um, Short-term extensions of the Renewable Energy Production Credit, the PTC, have helped keep wind energy companies competitive with traditional forms of energy. But the short-term extensions have created planning and investment uncertainty. The booms and busts, the extension and, 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 the, and the lack of extension have created uncertainty for new development of wind generation businesses, and most especially for the build-out of brand new manufacturing base in the U.S. By eliminating this uncertainty, a national renewable electric standard would provide the long-term commitment to manufacturers and developers alike to invest billions of dollars in the American worker that will be around forever in an industry where the source of fuel is infinite. This business certainty will help quickly deploy renewable energy sources in the short term to help achieve stronger emission reductions in the future at a lower cost. If you thought last year's historic high for wind contributing 42 percent of new generation capacity in the U.S., just wait to what you will see with the lasting commitment to renewables. Last year, while the U.S. economy was shedding hundreds of thousands of jobs, the wind industry added 35,000 new jobs, an addition of 55 new expanded or announced manufacturing facilities across the country. The renewable energy industry with wind power playing a major role is really poised to help lead the country out of the current recession and create a more sound economy. During the Bush administration, the Department of Energy concluded that wind energy could feasibly supply 20 percent of the nation's electricity by 2030. The 20 percent wind energy report, that's just one scenario. Certainly, we can do more, and we're already doing more. But I wanted to announce this. Even this one scenario, was they, they said that the numerous benefits from achieving that level of deployment would include supporting 500,000 new jobs, generating over a trillion in economic impact by the year 2030, decreasing natural gas prices by 12 percent, saving consumers between $43 billion and $171 billion, and avoided 825 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions in the electric sector in 2030, the equivalent of taking out 140 million cars off the road. Unfortunately, though, the United States is at a competitive disadvantage compared to the 37 countries around the world that have national renewable electric energy requirements, including China and India, which have mandatory requirements. The importance and benefits of a national RES are, are unbelievable because we stand at a critical crossroads as we determine how to promote job growth, building back a new economy of jobs that will be there forever. In addition to keeping our nation competitive with other countries, there are many other benefits. Numerous studies conclude that a national RES would save consumers money as renewable energy sources displace fossil fuel and avoid the volatility of fossil fuel prices. An excellent real-world example that I was involved in as the chairman of the State Commission in Oklahoma was the renewable electricity development that brought down costs to consumers is the experience of Oklahoma Gas and Electric. The entire cost of Oklahoma Gas and Electric Centennial Wind Project in Oklahoma was entirely offset by the natural gas fuel savings in 2007 alone, saving consumers in Arkansas and Oklahoma money. And that is a state that, that clearly can benefit. A national RES would create jobs. Of course, you know, the, the 46 states with power plants and manufacturing facilities, job growth is already expanding in every region of the country. 
A national RES will also bring benefits to all areas. The Energy Information Administration had found that the southeastern United States would be a net renewable energy exporter through 2019 under a national RES. Because a variety of resources are eligible for RES compliance, all regions of the country will be able to utilize other abundant renewable resources besides wind to meet the requirements. Further wind energy projects exist in 35 states already. Whereas other fuels are shipped by rails, pipelines, and national RES would promote the shipment of wind via transmission lines and allow utilities to purchase renewable energy credits from windiest regions. It's a down payment, too, on the greenhouse gas emissions. And I know I'm up against my deadline, and I know you'll pound that, but I want to tell you one more thing. What's really critical here is a study just came out within the last month that said in Europe alone, the wind generation that was added has avoided 7% 7 per, 7 of the greenhouse emissions from electric generation that would have been there before. So it is an immediate impact on removing carbon um, right now. Thank you very much for my opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Bodie. Our next witness is Mr. David Manning. He is the Vice President for External Affairs at National Grid, where he is responsible for federal issues and relations. Uh, he has also served as, as the president of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. So we welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As you know, I may be the only one here that was on the rigs in the high Arctic and also a delegate to Kyoto. So um, just quickly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Upton and members of the committee. National Grid is a very large uh, natural gas and electricity provider in the Northeast. We work from New York to New Hampshire. We serve about 15 million people. I am here to speak very specifically, however, sir, on the, the analysis which is available to us to explain the economic benefits of, of, of energy efficiency investment. Um, a couple of years ago at the World Economic Forum, there was great debate over whether or not we can do climate change, whether or not we can drive energy efficiency. Uh, without bankrupting the economy. And we heard a lot about that this evening in terms of the cost of action. Uh, there was a lack of, of substantive evidence, and uh, a group pulled together, including ourselves, Shell, DTE, Honeywell, Environmental Defense, uh, the NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and we all partnered with McKinsey and produced a, a study. It took over a year in production, and it analyzed all of the various means open to us in terms of investing in, in, in energy efficiency technologies. Uh, it was vetted by MIT, Princeton, Texas, A&M, UC Davis. And uh, if you look at nothing else, uh, I have attached to my written testimony what I call the McKinsey curve. And the McKinsey curve, uh, which came out in 2007, demonstrates that about 40 percent of the technologies that they reviewed are fully paid for themselves within their lifetime. So there is no net cost to those technologies. Quite obviously, you start with residential electronics. We know the computers can be much more effective, much more efficient. Uh, residential lighting. Uh, and as you work through, you then go into vehicles, you go into fuel and uh, in intensity of carbon fuels. So we have a pretty thorough analysis setting out all the various opportunities. And it is to drive a significant shift in capital investment away from less efficient, more emitting technologies and driving us to, to more cost-effective solutions. It assumed no technological breakthroughs. Eighty percent of the options reviewed relied on proven technology. The balance were considered high potential. And, and high potential in 2007 included cellulosic biofuels and, and plug-in hybrids. And of course now a number of companies are testing plug-in hybrids. So uh, it, it looked at a series of options going from least cost to greatest cost. And, and this is consistent with what New York City found in its New York City 2030 program that a great deal of the emissions within urban centers are in buildings. So your easy and, and, and earliest hits were in buildings and, and, and appliances. Uh, moving on, uh, vehicles and fuel, and, and fuel carbon intensity. The third move was industrials, sinks and forests, and then finally electric power options. What it also found was the, the maximum of all of those categories, no one category contributed more than 11 percent to the solution. So it is widely dispersed through the economy. And of course, that is part of our point, is that in order to invest in these technologies, you are driving an entire new industry. Just a few examples. Um, obviously, we have been doing a lot of work in energy efficiency in New Hampshire. Uh, we have been working throughout New England. 
and Massachusetts, we go back some 30 years in this experience. Just in the last year alone, we are partnering with Positive Energy. This is a firm doing a pilot in Massachusetts. They are based in the West Coast, and they are coming up with a tracking system for customers to demonstrate how their fuel consumption relates to those with similar uh, uh, properties. Reflex Lighting Group, uh, now doing state-of-the-art design work in Boston for commercial space. Uh, DMI, R.G. Vanderweil, two new design firms that are doing energy efficiency programs and products for commercial and, and customer installations. We are working with them. Evergreen Solar, Sharp Solar, these are made locally manufactured solar pr uh, providers and Solar Design Associates are designing our new building, which we are about to open just outside of Boston, which will be the second largest solar array in, in, uh, in New England. And that will be open in May. 3,300 square, I'm sorry, 330,000 square foot LEED certified building dedicated for National Grid, powered, of course, by a solar array. So there are, those are all those, those companies didn't exist a year or two ago. So uh, my point, sir, is that, and, and, and panel, is that we have a very real opportunity to not only pay for these opportunities in, sa in, in energy savings, but to drive new jobs. Very quickly, we spend $215 billion annually on the production of electricity. We only invest $2.6 billion in energy efficiency. In natural gas, we spend $1 to $2 per MCF on energy efficiency uh, compared to, I, I mean, the cost, I'm sorry, would be $1 to $2 compared to a cost of the fuel of $6 to $8. And multiple studies have demonstrated that you can do energy efficiency for approximately $0.03 cents per kilowatt hour saved. And electricity costs, of course, range anywhere from $0.06 to $0.12 cents and beyond. A lot of this has taken place in New England because of our higher cost of energy, but we can do it. Thank you, Mr. Manning, very much. Our final witness is uh, Yvette Pena, who is uh, Legislative Director of the Blue Green Alliance, a partnership between labor unions and environmental organizations uh, comprising more than 6 million people in support of good jobs and a green economy. We welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am testifying today. Uh, I'm afraid David Foster was supposed to testify, so obviously I'm not him. He's our executive director. Uh, he's very sorry he had to leave. He had a commitment um, outside of the country. Uh, the Blue Green Alliance is made up of the United Steel Workers, the Sierra Club, the Labor's International Union, the National Resource Defense Council, the Communication Workers of America, and SEIU. This collaboration of labor unions and environmental organizations is based on our common goal to build a clean energy economy, an economy that both creates good green union jobs and combats global warming. Several weeks ago, in response to the deepening economic and climate crisis, the Blue Green Alliance put forward a policy statement on climate change, the first such statement issued jointly by both labor unions and environmental organizations. <laughs> The policy statements stress the importance of including targets that rely on the best scientific evidence in an economy-wide cap-and-trade system that contains mechanisms to prevent job loss in globally competitive energy-intensive industries. And above all, the statement made clear that comprehensive climate change legislation should focus on the creation and retention of millions of families sustaining green jobs. I have I've submitted a copy of our policy statement for the record following my written testimony. Solving global, global warming will not be the economic calam calamity that some are predicting. Done right, the transition to a green economy will be the most important economic development tool of the 21st century. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 took the first step in that direction with a meaningful down payment on investments in the green economy. But this down payment could be wasted if we don't continue to make the large-scale investments that are necessary to transition the nation into a clean energy economy. Policies such as a strong renewable electricity standard, which is included in the draft bill, are essential in creating a regulatory framework that supports renewable energy, energy efficiency, and new transmission as they provide important market signals that will attract private investment at the scale necessary to put Americans back to work. A study released by the Blue Green Alliance and the Renewable Energy Policy Project of Component Manufacturing in the Renewable Energy Industry found that 850,000 manufacturing jobs could be created with $160 billion of investments in manufacturing. New wind turbine equipment plants have also been built in communities across the country, including North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Colorado, Arkansas, New York, North Carolina, and other places directly employing thousands of workers. Comprehensive climate change legisla legislation will also reinvigorate the construction industry in which 1.9 million people are now out of work, 
we must make greater investments in both commercial retrofitting and residential weatherization with the right standards that others have spoken about. Such energy savings can be put to use to finance a high wage, high road weatherization industry where livable wages are paid, health care is provided, and essential career and apprenticeship job training opportunities are made available to communities across America. As members of the committee are fully aware, global warming is a global problem. U.S. climate change legislation must not create perverse incentives for energy intensive industries to close their U.S. facilities because of rising energy costs and relocate them to countries that do not take effective action to curb emissions. Nor should energy intensive industries be left vulnerable to imports from countries that do not price carbon in energy intensive products. In either case, Americans lose jobs and global warming emissions increase. Among the mechanisms available to resolve the international competitive issue are allowance allocations to energy intensive industries, border adjustment mechanisms, and globally measurable and enforceable sectoral agreements within the framework of an international treaty. We are confident that this committee can craft the appropriate combination of these mechanisms to ensure that our domestic manufacturing industries remain both competitive and play their critical role in reducing their own emissions. Global warming is already destroying the livelihood of workers everywhere. Doing nothing is not an option. Before us are critical choices and decisions. Will we build a clean energy economy and put America's factory and construction workers back on the job? Will we advocate a new development model for developing countries that emphasizes consumption in their economies instead of unsustainable trade deficits in ours? Will we look back a year from now and say that we stood up for our country, our climate, and all humanity when it mattered? Your choices will decide which path we go down as a nation. <coughs> I believe that with the vision that has been laid out in the draft legislation, you have already taken steps down the right path for our workers and for our environment. The Blue-Green Alliance and its partner organizations look forward to working with members of the committee as you continue to work on this critical piece of legislation. Thank you. We thank you, Ms. Pena, very much. And now we'll turn and recognize Ms. Castor from the state of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all very much for your, your testimony today. I hear a lot from students and young entrepreneurs, and they're very motivated these days to uh, enter a green jobs field. What is your best advice for a young person? What should they be studying in school? How should they be preparing? Where are the, the opportunities today for those jobs? I would love to start. Uh, we have a real issue in this country in terms of math and science education. Uh, and this doesn't just apply to the new economy, the new energy economy. It applies to all the work that we must do as utilities to keep our, our own systems reliable. So I would have to say off the top that if you're having that conversation, if anyone has the aptitude or the interest to pursue science and engineering, speaking as a, as a, as a retired lawyer, um, I, I can offer great respect for mathematicians, for scientists, for engineers. But beyond that, of course, I think what, it, what is really significant is that the educational institutions that we now, now meet with and talk to, they are designing these programs in terms of, 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 of design, architecture, engineering, science. Um, that are, It's very difficult for us to know what we're going to need. Uh, the Bipartisan Action Group is meeting again tomorrow on this very issue, trying to figure out what sorts of needs they will have in terms of personnel. Don't forget also the average age of an employee within our company is very close to 50. So when you talk to these people, remind them that there's an entire generation of energy providers who are very close to retirement. So I think there's a pretty broad scope open to them. Thank you for the question. I think it's a great one. It's, uh, it's incredibly important to not limit the scope of the, uh, of the notion of what a green job is. Ideally, we'd love to see uh, jobs in inventing, making, installing, uh, using, maintaining, operating all of these systems here in this country. And that's a huge range of occupations and a huge range of areas and sectors. It's one of the reasons it's been hard to count the jobs because they're so diverse across so many sectors. I think uh, it's a, I would agree um, that math and science, math and science are critical not just for engineering, but what we're hearing from the folks, uh, our union partners who are running apprenticeship programs um, in elect electrical and in the building trades, is they also need folks to come in with basic math and science. It's an incredibly important skill. Um, I would also just reiterate what I said earlier, that many of these jobs are jobs that don't need a four-year degree. And while we want our young people who are interested all the young people who are interested and excited about going to a four-year college should be able to do that. But not all young people are in that category. There's 
150,000 dropouts last year in California. The Gates Foundation surveyed them and found 80 percent of them said if they had had job experience while in school, they would have stayed in school. And that's an incredibly important statistic, and I think we do need to give opportunities to folks who want to go into the trades, opportunities to folks who want to be building hands-on building these systems that we're talking about. Mainstream sort of new renewable job industry. Turn on the microphone, please. Am I on? Okay. Okay. Now I am. Um, we represent both the people involved in manufacturing of wind turbines, and there's over 8,000 parts in a wind turbine, as well as those people that develop um, the wind farm. So we deal with both. So what we've been trying to do and are doing through our education committee is developing curriculum that will provide the job training and working with a number of educational institutions, junior colleges, Botech schools, as well as four-year colleges, to develop um, the breadth of of training that will be necessary for these jobs. Um, we have uh, at our wind power conference that will be in Chicago, Illinois, the first week in May, we will have approximately 20,000 people attending that conference. We have one of the days of the conference set aside for young people and for people in academics who want to come in and meet the 1,200 um, exhibitors uh, who are manufacturers, supply chain um, folks, as well as developers to talk with job possibilities. And we are there to talk with them as well. So right. contact us. We are putting together an internship program. We are, we are right. all about the jobs and the people. And I have another uh, question. It's a, a bit broader. You know, last week the Environmental Protection Agency issued its its uh, proposed endangerment finding that, that follows on the U.S. Supreme Court decision that, that says EPA has a legal authority and obligation to regulate greenhouse gases. And, you know, if the Congress, uh, if we can't get it together and pass a, a cap and trade or a, a, an energy bill here, it will probably be left to EPA uh, to regulate it. What would that do to uh, green jobs initiatives and to your your growing industries. Again, if I could open, I think we have a strong preference, which is one of the reasons we're very pleased to be included in this panel. We have a strong preference for a legislative response, which can provide the kind of flexibility and the investment opportunities that make sense. We're a very large company. We're a very large industry. All of us collectively, uh, our preference would be that we we come up with a regime, or that you come up with a regime which we can, a set of rules that we can live by and drive the right kind of investments. So uh, Mass versus EPA, we're very familiar with that case. We're very familiar with the, the work of the EPA in terms of, 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 of uh, regulating uh, what we do as power generators. Um, our preference would be that we come up with or that you come up with a, a set of rules that will really address this problem. We're, ve we're very anxious to get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlelady's time has expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton. Mr. Manning, I'm, we sort of chuckled back here when you said you were very glad to be on this panel. If I were you, I would have asked to have been on panel two or three. <laughs> uh, I have just a couple questions, and I hopefully will not take my, my full five minutes. Uh, Ms. Pena, you talked about the Blue-Green Coalition and how broad it is, which was uh, exciting to hear. Uh, I'm a supporter of uh, a renewable portfolio standard. Obviously, the question is what is in the details, what's in the base. Uh, I'm one that happens to believe that uh, hydro ought to be in there, both old and new. Uh, waste to energy, I think, is very important. We see that in my district. Uh, gas line runs right through a, a landfill, and they provide uh, gas heat or gas uh, for, I believe, 1,200 homes uh, a day from the uh, methane produced from that. Uh, I'm a supporter of nuclear, and that is my question for you. We have uh, two nuclear plants in my district. Uh, we had the unfortunate incident uh, last fall of having a turbine uh, uh, lose a blade and it was destroyed. Uh, and there are now 500 folks you know, working to repair that turbine. As you can imagine, it's pretty big. Uh, that turbine was made in Germany because we turned the switch from green to red on nuclear, uh, we lost, we've lost a lot of jobs. Among, I think, in your coalition, you talked about the steel workers. When my two plants were built, 85 percent of the components of those two plants were built in this country. Because we've not turned on a new plant in a couple of decades, 85 percent of the components are now made someplace else, as we've seen uh, with this turbine. Uh, would your organization uh, support nuclear uh, with no greenhouse gas emissions? 
as part of a renewable uh, portfolio standard? We do not have a position on nuclear energy. Some but we might various be able to organizations you. have varying uh, positions you on would, the issue. I just know that the steelworkers, I believe they're supportive of that, right? I, well, I don't know. I, it would be great if you could go back to them because this would really create tens of thousands of jobs uh, if, if we're able to do that. Knowing my time is running out, I'm going to not use all my time. Um, Ms. Bodie, uh, a question that I've been asking my crew for a long time, and maybe you know the answer. This proposal, uh, the draft bill, has a 25 percent yes. standard by 25. Obviously, a lot of that is wind. Unlike some people from Massachusetts, I actually support wind in water. Lake Michigan, though I don't, maybe Mr. Manning, I don't know whether you support it off Nantucket or not. Do you? You do. Do you hear that, Mr. Markey? He supports wind off Nantucket. Um, maybe you'll be delegated to panel five next time. <laughs> how, about wind, all, how about wind in Lake Michigan? I just said that I support that. Oh, you do? Okay. Do. Oh, good. I do. I do Excellent. support that. Excellent. Um, the question, though, that I have for you, Ms. Bodie, is we actually, we, provide, we have some of those green jobs that we've talked about. In my district, we actually make the cap, uh, which weighs 32,000 pounds uh, on the 80-meter wind turbines. Uh, great, good jobs. Uh, in, in a little town in my district. Now, they provide, uh, I if we end up going to 25 percent, I don't know what the wind component of that will be. I would guess, what, 10 to 15 maybe, if we don't include nuclear? Yes, uh, well, how much, knowing that today it's less than 1 percent wind, how much space in America do we need for how, how, how many wind turbines do we need at 80 meters tall? Because they're the most efficient, right? Um, actually, we're, they're actually going up to 100 feet now. Okay. Um, and, well, they're well, 80 meters, that's pretty. But in uh, essence, uh -huh. how, how much space do we need? Land space do we need? Right now, there are 35 states that are producing, that have wind turbines and, and wind generation um, in terms of right. uh, producing wind, in terms of uh, the space to, to do that. Um, I think I, I haven't measured it in terms of half of the state or part of the state, but I think the footprint is probably um, probably uh, um, less important in in the fact well, that a wind, turbine, a wind turbine a wind turbine put up on land um, continues to allow the land to have multiple uses, and in fact, you know, uh, and that's you know, in some respects, that's very different than need, all other forms of generation. But how close do you put these uh, 80 meter jobs? together. Well, let's put it this way. In Germany, they have 20% um, penetration, and I think they're very comfortable with the amount of wind turbines they have put up in their country. The same thing with Italy, France, and it's a much smaller much, space. Again, remember, I'm United a supporter. States. I mean, yes. do we need the size of Iowa? Do we need the size of, I mean, you, how, how, much, how much space do we need to generate 10 to 15 percent of our energy from wind? I have no idea. All right. Well, I mean, you, but, but the point is that, that you're you not taking out land out of If the gentleman would yield, I've got some stats. Uh, I tell you what, the gentleman's time has expired, mm -hmm. and I can recognize the gentleman from, if the gentleman wouldn't mind, I can recognize the gentleman from Illinois on his own time. Then I'm not going to use my stats. <laughs> my question. Well, and I've got the answer to his question. My brilliant staffer, who has uh, a lot more um, statistics than I do at his fingertips, if I could answer. Sure. Apparently, um, it is uh, actual land use is 2 to 5 percent of the land covered, um, which is less than half of the area of Anchorage, Alaska. Um, so onshore land use would be approximately 12.3 million acres. But of course, in almost every case, that land has continued to be multiple use. Okay, understand it. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois. So let, me, let me just add to that then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Take a steel mill that uses 545 million kilowatts per year. It would require roughly 138 wind turbines on roughly 12,443 acres of land for a total output. However, during peak load at that steel mill, it requires 100,000 kilowatts. For that, you would need roughly 825 turbines on 33,000 acres of land to account for peak load. Uh, this, this wind panacea is just scary. Um, the, the, uh, the president in his inaugural address said, we will 
run our factories, manufacturing factories on wind and solar. Dr. Seuss couldn't write a better line. That is irresponsible. Base load generation will always be major traditional electricity generation, whether that's coal or that's nuclear power or it's going to be major hydro. Now, renewables can help, and I'm probably, I, probably one of the few members who climbed a wind turbine, Mr. Chairman. I know you'd be shocked that I actually uh, climbed one during my break. I, I encourage everybody to visit coal-fired power plants or coal mines. Uh, I also did climb all the way up to the top of the turbine and, and got a, had a good tour of that. So we're not anti this, but, to, but for people to propose that we're going to solve our electricity problems and, 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 and stay competitive worldwide on wind and solar are being very disingenuous. And so that's why part of our debate is in this bill, which has a gaping hole, which is the credit allocation. Are you all comfortable with the fact that there are some folks cutting backroom deals on the credit allocations and that, and that we are not here discussing the allocation of those credits right now? Ms. Pena? If, if I could. If I no, could. I asked Ms. Pena first. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for real quickly. I've only got 2:40, and the chairman's and I, hot on time. And, the, and that question will be answered. Um, and, and obviously, we're having a lot of discussions on it. We need to. So you're part of the backroom deals too. Well, I. I yes. No, no. I mean, obviously, the no, chairman has. I, no, there's 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 deals being cut right now. So if you're not back there, you better you better get back there. Because folks are negotiating these credits. Now, we should be discussing these credits out here in the open so that we can then also score them. So do you think we should have those out for everyone to see so we can address the benefits? I believe we need allocations and we need investment. How about transparency? Actually, How about transparency? Y'all are for transparency, aren't you? There is transparency in this process, There's, sir. There is. So can you tell me the credit allocation right now? It's being discussed. Uh, and who's discussing it? The chairman, the various constituents. In the back rooms. In the back room, which I've not been invited to yet. That's not dealing in, in helping me on coal production and electricity generation. I can only answer what we believe. And we Mr. Manning? Our, our position has been very public in terms of allocation. We believe that. Should there be, let me ask this question on my time. Show. Should there be a 100% auction? Ms. Pena, yes or no? 100% auction. Yes or no? We need to continue to discuss that. Uh, we need to move promptly to 100% auction, yes or no? Ultimately, yes. Yes. Ms. Bodie, 100% auction. Should we have 100% auction? Ms. Bodie? I don't know what's being discussed in the back rooms. I'm sorry. I'm no, the question is, should we have 100 percent auction of credits? <laughs> oh, okay. The question is, should we have 100 percent auction of credits? Aren't these important questions, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Well, did you invite I, the panel here? I don't think there should be 100 percent. No, I'm, not, I'm asking the panel that you've invited. Hey, please. Should they be answering? Should there be a 100 percent auction of credits? I don't know the answer to your question. Okay. Next. I think we, we, our alliance hasn't come to a specific position on this, but we definitely believe there needs to be a transition period where- Mr. Ackerman, please. Street. Should there be a 100 percent- Ultimately, yes. Someone. But there needs to be a transition period that includes but, some allocations, and we need to make sure we invest auction proceeds back into the clean energy economy. Mr. Ackerman. Well, I'm, I'm in favor of 100 percent auction, and I'm Thank you. transparency Thank you. in making these deals. I think Thank the question you. of is there transitional assistance needed is a separable question. Right. And, but we should be discussing these credits. Yeah. If we move to a markup of a bill on Tuesday and we don't have the credit allocation, that will pose a question, Mr. Chairman, one that you asked in past energy bills, of who's writing the bill in the back room. 
And with that, I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman very much. And I thank uh, all the members of the committee for this uh, historically long hearing. And uh, you don't hear many witnesses ever say thank you for inviting me this evening to testify. <laughs> this is one of those, one of our witnesses. Has Mr. That. Martin. Raise, I, I, yes. I just wanted a point of personal privilege. I wanted to share the fact that my brother and sister-in-law are here from Carlisle, Massachusetts. Where are they, two, please? I would love daughters. to see them and welcome from and Carlisle. And this is the first congressional hearing they've ever, they've ever been to. And so I just wanted Fantastic. to make sure that everyone knew Hopefully um, they, they were here. here at 10. Oh, Carlisle is like the aristocracy of Massachusetts. <laughs> so thank you so much for, uh, for being here today. And your, your sister-in-law did a fantastic job here today. Tomorrow morning, by the way, our first hearing is on the allocation policies to, uh, of carbon credits in order to uh, assist and benefit uh, consumers. And we will have um, uh, seven witnesses beginning at 9.30 tomorrow morning to begin the discussion of uh, carbon credits and uh, and its uh, and its implementation in a way that will protect consumers in America. Again, we thank all of you for your um, patience today and for your tremendous contributions uh, to this process. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned.